Well, we had we have this friend Mark Cosgrove um, who runs a cinema in Bristol, um, and we'd been commissioned by another venue, Colston Hall, soon to not be called Colston Hall, um, uh, to 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 write the score for a. Uh, a silent film and so Mark showed us in his cinema I think 20 uh, something like 20 films or something yeah I mean when you're looking at the silent cinema thing there's so many I mean first of all a lot of them are uh, you know not representative of the films they used to be they've, they've, they've kind of lost their uh, original edits you know bits have fallen off bits are burnt probably other people have just scissored bits out to fill them in the can or whatever it is, you know. So there, um, there's lots of crazy edits in them. And of course, when you're trying to do music, that's not what you want to be doing is, you know, trying to deal with flipping around. You know, you, you want some kind of argument that develops and has a bit of gravitas that you can maintain and give some musical space to that then will unfold uh, without having to be sidetracked in, you know, a, a plot or an edit or somewhere location Way. And of course, that's what this film had. It had this amazing, well, the very first scene is 17 minutes long and it's yeah. in one location, in one mood, with one sort of trajectory. So you're given, therefore, you know, this 17 minutes of musical space to fill. Uh, and none of the other films had that kind of gravitas right. and long sort of progression of musical development possibility. I, I imagine to some extent, if I'm thinking about it, we probably had some kind of an agenda between us that we'd already thought out about instrumentation slightly, or at least um, a musical kind of world that we wanted to inhabit. And um, rather than just finding a film and then serving the film, um, we, w we had a, a, a slight idea about what we wanted, and actually that completely fitted. The slow pace of it was enabled us to do um, the kind of things that we wanted and the kind of instrument the instrumentation that we wanted as well. Well, that's very important, isn't it? The, what you're saying there about how, the, as you as a composer, relate to the film, because yeah. um, obviously you are giving over your entire sort of imagination and uh, ideas to what is uh, an existing piece. Um, and th there has to feel like th that you're getting something back from it. You're yeah. being given the opportunity to, um, you know, come up with ideas that you want to come up with. Yeah, because you preset. need to be inspired musically uh, to do it and also to serve the film and um, not try and dominate the film because um, you are there to underscore this action and the, this this idea that this person had. Well, y yes, and I think that one of the great traditions of silent film is that you improvise to the picture. Yeah, and that 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 is um, where this this idea of your your just allow, you're allowing the actor to do what they do amazingly well and not sort of tread on it, but at the same time, you're supporting that. So it does feel like very much like a duet and you're responding. And if you're sitting down looking at a bit of music that's been written out and not observing the screen and just playing it, mm. you know, that space is not as interesting ultimately, uh, certainly for certain crucial moments of the film where, you know, things are so dramatic that they're sort of so in the moment that um, I think that's where improvisation uh, is very important in yeah. silent cinema. I think so, and I think actually, um, I think a bit of both is good. If yes. you've got a, a score that you have some flexibility with and you've got things that work, you know they work, because we all know how difficult it is to improvise to an hour and a half film. Um, it can sometimes work and it can sometimes not. So it's good to have a plot, isn't it, uh, uh, that you know this is going to be OK and then this area is is improvised so that you've got the feeling for the moment and for what is happening on the screen. Very difficult to... I mean, we've all... There's very little improvising in um, Joan. But that was very much something we talked about, wasn't it? About to building in these moments of flexibility. Mm, yeah. Um, to, to, so so that, we're, that we're, we're, we're the actors. And a lot of the time, um, there'll be a sort of repeating motif and then some individual will be soloing and looking at the screen so yeah. that, that they fulfill that role while the backing is sort of being fleshed out by the, you know, the 20 or so musicians. Yeah. We had a theme, didn't we? A Joan theme. Yeah. That um, was made out of actually... I know it was a written tune, but we also had code as well, 
where we took um, where we took um, letters and turned them into musical notes from, from Joan of Arc, yes. Jeanne d'Arc. Yeah, yeah. And um, so there was a bit of thematic writing, but it wasn't. We didn't. I don't think we did that thing of um, uh, Peter and the Wolf. Here comes the wolf, and here comes you know. This is no. the. Um, which I think works. I think it works if you, you know, but we didn't do that. There's a little bit of theme, thematic stuff that repeats, um, but we didn't have themes for characters. No, I think early on that theme is identified with her, for what yeah. I remember, um, in, in the trial scene. Yeah. And there's that moment where she says some brilliant things about, you know, she won't answer them, she won't give them what they want to hear. She kind of answers them in these wonderful riddles. Uh, and I think there is a quite a, that's when the Joan theme comes out when her character, this defiance and this yeah. sort of rebelliousness and absolute doggedly not, I'm not going to give you how I relate to my God, you know, that's personal. And um, so, but I think after that, you know, we, we know who she is, you know, mm. we kind of know it's more like what she's going through that we're sort of picking up on. And we did repeat that theme throughout. Yeah three or four times. Yeah, it becomes in different guises, doesn't mm, it? Yeah. Yeah, we chose that palette because, you know, you'd wanted to work with uh, a choir, a kind of, um, I guess, medieval style. We were looking at early music, weren't we? And um, You'd been was... working on with guitar, so you definitely knew you wanted a, a guitar sort of um, mini ensemble orchestra. Yeah, I was interested in... The, the kind of weaving of six guitars, uh, you know, things that you could play on one guitar uh, being played on six and split up between six guitars. So one, you know, like, if you're finger-picking a guitar and there were six notes going on, then I would divide it up between six guitars and everybody would play one, almost like a, you know, like an orchestra. Um, and I was interested in that kind of concept and also the kind of droneness of that with tuning guitars all to one note and... Um, having this kind of, almost like you say, hurdy-gurdy type drone, medieval, but not really medieval instruments, you know, electric mm. guitars. Don't think they had them then, did they? Electric guitars. I don't think they did. They had to wait, didn't they? Yeah. Mm. And, and also Charles, uh, the conductor, gave us access to a choir beforehand to sort of experiment with, and that was very useful. Um, yeah, because you'd written some beautiful... Uh, sketches for for choir to get ideas, and we were listening to um, is it David Murray or M somebody you gave oh, me? Oh, David Monroe. Monroe, yeah, the early music guy. Yes. Um, so we were listening to that kind of thing, and you'd written some sketches. And um, what's his name? Peritin. I oh, got yes. very into Peritin. Um, yeah. Vider and Omnes. Is this the Notre Dame? Yeah, the yeah. Notre Dame school, where they, for the first time, somebody had the idea of having a harmony yeah. um, to the melody. And apparently, at the time, they all, you know, it was like psychedelic, stealing, like them. taking drugs. Yeah. When they heard the harmony, they all sort of went insane. because And especially in that long reverb of Notre Dame, where the huge space, you could hear this massive blooming harmony. I think they'd sung in unison before that. In just all one been in note. unison yeah. or in octaves. Octaves, but yeah. But to do fifths and thirds, you know, that was a something been. hadn't been allowed into the church or something. Anyway, yeah. so there was a there was a bit of inspiration from from Peritin. Uh, and also Charles gave us a, a choir to, to experiment on and so some of the ideas were like, mm, everybody singing a glissando, it's not actually quite as beautiful. And, and we also uh, tried quarter tones, quarter which tones. is very, very difficult in between the cracks. Mm -hmm. um, I think we were listening to the score for Polanski's film... Um, the Fearless uh, Vampire Kids. Yes, and yeah. the, the score for that is amazing. And they're, they're, they're bending the notes out of tune with each other and stuff. I remember talking about that at the time. Yes. Um, I don't think we ended up with any... Well, little bits of it. Little we, bits yeah. remained, but yeah. um, certainly it was very good to see the reality of what all these fantastic ideas were. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I get excited about film music because of Collision of Styles. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that so many great film scores have been... The, the, you know, the composers have been allowed to be this chameleon where they've on the one hand, you know, they've put on their easy listening hat and then the next minute they've put on their Stockhausen hat mm -hmm. and the next minute they've put on their 
you know, bossa nova hat or whatever it is, but they've been allowed to morph between different styles. And within, presumably, in some of these amazing film recording sessions, on one corner there will have been, you know, Tycho drum orchestra. Yeah. On the other side, there'll have been, you know, a sort of Hebridean pipe band or something. And you'll have had all this stuff going on in one place. And I think that that is an exciting thing and it also has enabled um it's way it's been educational i think for for audiences because some of these uh sort of hitherto unknown styles you know unpopular styles yeah absolutely have been kind of sho shoehorned in yeah trojan horse style uh, well um and they've they've created an identity if you think of ipcrest file and the chimbalon that is within traditional uh, orchestral instruments bass flute and strings and a piano, and then there's this funny hammer dulcimer chimbalon um, Romanian instrument in, in in the middle of it, and it, it it's a very spy sound because that was created by John Barry, and it is really an amalgam of cultures, which is really exciting always, isn't it? Mm. I'm always excited by the idea of you know pure electronic synthesizers, old analog synthesizers, and orchestras together, which you've done a lot of. We did two performances of it. One was at the Globe. Theatre in London, um, which is a t an open air space, really. So, so uh, couldn't be more opposite to where we did the second, which is in World's Cathedral, which is this immense, beautiful, effectively shoebox mm. sort of dimensions. Uh, and um, so, but actually, for for certain scenes like when the choir uh, are really blossoming and blooming, mm. you know, that ecclesiastical space is perfect. It's beautiful. Yeah. But then there's this outside scenes at the end where um, you know the crowd are running riot and the guitars are going for it. That maybe that slightly drier, more precise sound uh, works from the globe. Mm. Um, and also, you know, doing it in front of an audience is 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 very special. And I think after I remember particularly after the globe performance, um, somebody or two or three people came up to me who were really quite in a bad way, I would say. Mm. Um, one of them had been, was, was from Northern Ireland and had lived through the Troubles, obviously, which has a, you know, contemporary religious fraught situation there. And um, she was really in bits, I think, at the end of it. And it was sort of amazing to see, you know, the, what power had been unleashed during that performance. And, I, and you can't reproduce that in, in a studio? No. no, it's quite difficult. That's right, yeah, we were going to record it in a studio um, to have complete and utter control and able to, for you and I, to take it away once we'd recorded the, all the musicians and add some more things and, you know, stereo and all of the things. Um, but I think, I think in actually, in reality, we, we've got something more powerful and um, a little more fluid than possibly you would have in a studio, but I think that's its power. It's it's a response. It's a live response to what's happening, and um, I'm glad we did that. And the two spaces we played in were very very useful for us. Uh, in, as you say, the Globe had a very dead sound, which was good for the power of the brass and the guitars. And Wells Cathedral was absolutely beautiful for the for the voices. And, and actually would have been very difficult to reproduce in a studio somewhere. You can use modern effects, but um, the sound of the church, the cathedral, was amazing. And it's that huge history of Wells Cathedral um, for choral music and, you know, that's soaked up into its um, perpendic perpendicular Gothic interior. <laughs> Beautiful space, and that's actually it's actually quite inspiring being in there, isn't it? Mm. Um, just looking, and and particularly with, the, with this film, mm. I was a bit I had trepidation about whether we should actually perform Joan. We've done it twice in churches and cathedrals, we did Bath Abbey and Wales Cathedral, um, and I thought it might be kind of a bit of an obvious mm. choice, but actually it really worked, didn't it? Mm. Yeah, I think the setting ecclesiastical setting for it. Uh, it just sort of doubles the power of the hypocrisy. Mm, it does. And the, you know, on the, other, on the other side, the absolute faith and devotion side of it, you know, it sort of becomes even more three-dimensional. Mm, yeah, it. definitely. It's time to do another one and uh, well, that's use it, some new ideas. Well, that's it, isn't it? Rather than putting yeah. energy into something that you've done already, it's always yeah. good to... 
do something new. Yeah. I don't think we'll find another Joan, though. I mean, no, that's, it's very that's difficult. A... I've been looking for films and extremely difficult to find something as powerful and kind of perfect in a way. Mm.